It's nearly the middle of November, and uh, we've had a few weeks of heavy rain here in Galway. So I thought it was about time I'd give an update on my back garden pond that I created back uh, last Christmas. I'd originally planned to give an update back in July, and I'm not entirely sure where all the time went to, but here we are anyway. When I gave the last update in early May, the growing season had really just begun, and apart from the marigolds, most of the aquatic plants and border plants hadn't yet appeared. Thankfully, most of the plants grew just fine during the summer, as it turned out. The irises and the lilies thrived, the meadowsweet bloomed, and the rushes got bigger as the years progressed. In the previous video, you can see that I still had many of the plants uh, in pots or baskets in the water. Uh, I've since added more soil to the pond, so I've, I've removed a lot of the plants from the, the baskets and pots and planted them directly into the soil. I used some soil from the garden um, that I dug out when I made the pond, but most of it was aquatic soil that I bought at a local garden centre. The aquatic soil works fine, actually, for, for, planting, uh, for planting, but there was an issue with it that I'll come back to later in the video. The reason for leaving the plants in the baskets when I originally planted them uh, was to make sure I had them in the right place. I wanted the pond to kind of settle down a bit before I decided where I'd put the plants permanently. This proved useful for the rushes because as they grew I realised I needed to move them. Uh, the main reason for moving them was that I had actually created a shallow area to the side of the pond to encourage birds to drink and, and bathe there. And from my home office upstairs in the house, I have a clear view of that spot. As the rushes grew bigger, they blocked the view, so I decided to move the rushes. There is actually another good reason for keeping rushes in baskets or pots, even in, on a permanent basis, and that's because the root system gets really large, as I found out to my cost uh, in the previous pond that I had. So leaving them in the baskets kind of keeps them a bit under control as well. I mentioned in the previous video that evaporation had been a bit of a problem. Uh, it was kind of dry last spring. As the summer progressed, uh, there was another prolonged period of no rain and there was quite a bit of evaporation. Luckily, I had stored rainwater in two large barrels and, and was able to keep the pond topped up, not fully, but, but enough to stop any of the plants dropping, uh, drying out. I had actually intended to buy a larger water uh, container but never got around to it, so I might do that next year. As I mentioned before, I have a very large flat roof which is great for collection, collecting rainwater, which is near the pond. So if I do get a bigger tank, I'll be able to keep it filled. As the summer progressed, um, I did have a bit of an issue with algae build up or pond slime. Um, my solution uh, was fairly simple. I used a bamboo cane to fish some of it out every day. I usually took my coffee breaks down by the pond during the summer and every coffee break involved dragging out green slime and dragging it to the end of the to the edge of the pond to let it dry out. I think um, algae or pond slime will continue to be a problem with the pond. It's kind of small. Um, I've put in some barley straw uh, which is meant to try and break down some of that um, slime, so we'll see how it works. In terms of the plantings or the selection of plants that I used, I think it's fair to say that there wasn't much method in how I selected them. It was really whatever the local garden centre had in stock. I, I might try and do an inventory of the plants that I put in and, and post a link to it here. By mistake, I added one of those aquarium plants that spreads very rapidly. And it blocked the light from the lilies below. Um, I've got rid of it since, so hopefully I'll have uh, more lilies next year. When I dug the pond originally, I had the idea of planting um, small wildflower meadows either side of the pond to encourage insects and biodiversity, but it didn't really work out as a plan. Um, the borage and toad flax just about managed to hold their own against the grass, but, but one of the patches became a very uh, dense uh, patch of grass that choked everything else. It did provide some cover for the frogs later in the year, uh, but I didn't get any grasshoppers or other insects. It, it, it was just a, a dense patch of grass.
So I've cleared that back. Um, I've dug it out completely, actually, and I will. Uh, I'll have a go next year, and maybe have something a little less uh, dense. The other patch uh, worked a bit better. I, I constantly pulled out grass as it grew up to give the flowers a chance. That some fox glove and yarrow there, and hopefully they will spread uh, and and multiply for next year. The second patch is also beside the Bug Hotel and also beside a dead hedge that I've created. So I don't want to disturb it too much. Immediately around the pond, the ground is covered with uh, tree bark that I got in the local garden centre. Uh, the bark is, is very handy and uh, it, it serves a few different purposes. It's neat and and dry particularly during the summer so it's easy for me to walk around the pond uh, even in my slippers uh, which is a, a treat um, and it's also a great habitat for bugs um, the blackbirds love um, digging through it and sending bits of bark flying in the air as they look for insects and it is a great habitat and spiders love it you see hundreds of spiders um, particularly during the summer because it, the, the bark gives them cover. The bark has, has a couple of other advantages too. One, um, over time it breaks down into, into soil basically and, and uh, I, that's what I use it for. Um, but also during the middle of the summer when it was very hot and, and the bark got drier, um, it enabled the young sparrows to have dust baths which is a part of their grooming routine. They, they dig little um, shallow indentations into the bark and uh, toss the dust in through their feathers. The other feature uh, by the pond is the, the dwarf apple tree. I deliberately dug the pond so that the, the tree would overhang the pond. And uh, back in May, when I made the last video, uh, the um, tree was just about, was in blossom. Um, uh, it subsequently um, produced a fine crop of apples later in the summer and acted as a useful overhang for the birds um, and, and there were always birds uh, perched in it. Um, right now it's starting to lose its leaves. Um, I'll try and scoop a few of them out since they're falling into the pond and I don't want, I don't want too many leaves falling into the pond. And, um, encouraging um, more pond slime for next year. Back in May, the first of two pairs of swallows arrived uh, in the garden, perching on the telephone wires that stretch uh, across the garden. I'm not sure where they were nesting. I think it was somewhere in the hospital complex that's over the back wall of, of all the gardens in the street. I'm sure some of them, at least, were returning birds, and for them, of course, there's a change from last year. Uh, now there was a new source of mud and water that they could use to build their nests. It's fascinating to watch them in action. They're very cautious about landing near the pond. Sometimes one of them would sit on the telephone wire above the pond, chattering away as if on guard, while the other would land and start harvesting mud. Uh, other times, both of them would swoop around the pond several times looking around before they'd actually land. I mentioned earlier that I had used aquatic soil bought from a garden centre to uh, provide soil in the pond. It's less fertile than the soil in the garden so it produces less pond algae and it's got a nice consistency that the plants seem to like to bed in. However it has one disadvantage. The swallows didn't rate it much for nest building and if there's one thing swallows know it's the right sort of mud for, for building nests. I'd noticed that they preferred the darker soil around the plants that I'd introduced into the pond, which was the soil that came in the flower pots uh, that the, the plants came in, rather than the, the more abundant aquatic soil that was everywhere else in the pond. Ironically, the subsoil that I dug out to create the pond in the first place was a grey-blue dense soil that is essentially waterproof and sets like concrete when it dries. There were still clumps of that soil around, scattered across the garden. So I took a few pieces, broke them down into gravel with a hammer, and then turned it back into mud by soaking it overnight and mushing it up a bit. I then took that mud and spread it along the edge of the pond, and immediately the swallows started using it instead of the aquatic soil. <laughs> 
the reason I suspected the swallows were returning pairs was because they only spent a few days fetching mud, which suggests that they were repairing existing nests rather than building a new one from scratch, which would take quite a bit longer. I'll be sure to have plenty more of that mud all around the edges of the pond in place uh, before the swallows return next year. Apart from the swallows, the sparrows, blackbirds, goldfinches and starlings continue to use the pond for both bathing and drinking, particularly the birds that had just fledged from the nest. I can't forget the pigeons either, since they seem to devote every waking hour to walking in front of the trailer cams and triggering the cameras. At one point, almost 30 pigeons were calling to the garden, so there was nearly always one of them splashing about in the pond having a wash. As summer progressed and the fledging season ended, it, there was more natural food available, so I stopped filling the feeders and uh, the freeloaders stopped calling. The pigeons moved on straight away. It's amazing, pretty much a few days after the feeders stopped being filled, they disappeared and they moved on. And the number of sparrows and goldfinches reduced uh, quite a bit too. Now that autumn is pretty much done, I've started putting out food again and already the goldfinches and sparrows are back at the feeders. One of my ambitions for the pond was that it would become a haven for either dragonflies or damselflies. It was kind of a strange year this year for dragonflies uh, in general, at least in the places that I usually visit around Galway. They seem very scarce at the start of the summer in May and June. But as the weather improved in late June, early July and it got warmer, they suddenly appeared in abundance. However, they weren't appearing in my garden. Um, Occasionally, uh, dragonflies would, would swoop in. Uh, I think they were mainly emperor dragonflies. But that isn't surprising because the River Corrib and the Eglinton Canal are close enough to where I live. But I didn't see any sign of dragonflies uh, setting up home in the garden or near the pond. Now, maybe it was a bit optimistic of me assuming that uh, dragonflies and damselflies would discover the pond uh, in the very first year and settle in. So I could accept if I had to wait another year. As it turned out, I didn't have to wait. Um, in September, uh, in the first week of September, a pair of ruddy darter dragonflies appeared in the garden. They mated and laid eggs. The dragonflies did that kind of dipping motion over the water, which is the female uh, depositing the eggs just under the surface. The male ruddy darter spent a lot of the time sunning itself during the warm September days. It was effectively guarding the pond. It would do a little fly around, make sure nobody, no other dragonfly was uh, intruding on its domain and, and then return to one of the perches. Uh, there wasn't a lot to guard against really. Uh, some other darters did appear occasionally, but most of the time it was just the breeding pair. Darters prefer shallow pools with plenty of vegetation. And as it happened by September, that described my pond perfectly. Darters also like to perch on overhanging branches and I have to say it, it was very gratifying to see a dragonfly sunning itself on a perch that I'd set up, set up last September for that very purpose. Apart from the dragonflies, I haven't seen many other types of insects living in the water yet. Uh, pond skaters were the first insects to colonise the pond for couple of weeks there was just a single pond skater and then there was two for a few more weeks I know there's absolutely dozens of them um, and they're really the predominant insect uh, living in the pond um, I did spot her spot a single water boatman beetle um, swimming in the water a couple of months ago but I subsequently saw it floating upside down dead then <laughs> a few weeks afterwards so I haven't seen much else since um, hopefully more will find the pond next year I regularly spotted wasps coming to the pond to drink, though I didn't see any of the bees uh, that, that had emerged from the bee hotel nearby using the pond. I'm not sure where the wasps nest. It, it's close by, but I assume it's it's somewhere uh, in the hospital complex that, that adjoins the street I live in. Um, I did happen to see a couple of the leafcutter bees dead in the water. Leafcutters have a very brief life as flying insects, so they were ones that had probably laid their eggs, uh, sealed them up and had run their course. The flowers and plants around the pond attracted lots of hoverflies and butterflies all through the summer. The great thing about flowers like borage, uh, purple toad flax and water mint is that they last mo almost all the summer and continue to support insects 
right throughout the seasons. In fact, there's still some borage in flower in the pond even now. Back in early May, I was wondering how the tadpoles would fare in the future. Uh, as I mentioned in the last video, they were beginning to transition from tadpole to frog, and soon after, in the middle of May, they, they all seemed to just disappear. I, I, I was expecting to see sort of froglets around the place, but I, I couldn't find any. And I wondered if they'd all been eaten by the blackbirds or crows. But in early July, the lawn was suddenly full of little frogs hopping about the place and trying to make a run for it. They were in and around the pond as well, but they all seemed to have an instinct to hop towards the front of the house, uh, up to the lawn, and some of them even got into the house uh, briefly. Um, every time I'd mow the small patch of lawn that I was keeping neat, I'd have to do a sweep first to check for frogs, and I'd usually find two or three little ones and catch them and put them back in the pond before I could start mowing. As summer progressed, the frogs got bigger and it felt like quite a lot of them had survived. Um, some of them would hide in kind of small burrows between the, beneath the stones that were at the edge of the pond. There was one particular spot where they had tunneled under. Uh, and by late summer, um, it was clear that a lot of them had made it to adult halt and were, were growing substantially bigger. And I'd spot them occasionally when uh, I'd disturb one if I was doing maintenance around the pond. They were quite good at staying hidden and, and it was really only when I was messing around uh, at the edge of the pond or lifting stuff out of the water that I'd, I'd see one uh, through disturbing it. By now they should have all gone into hibernation. I prepared some uh, ground at the edge of the pond in a sheltered area which hopefully they'll, they'll use for hibernation and the real test will be next spring to see if, if I get some frog spawn. So what are my conclusions? Well, the pond continues to be a great source of interest and fulfilment for me. Most of the things that I hoped would happen in terms of the wildlife that it would attract did happen. So that's very satisfying. The pond does require regular intervention, either to top it up or clear out uh, build-ups of pond slime and algae. But that's okay, it's not a natural pool, and part of the enjoyment for me is going down to the pond every day, even for a few minutes during a coffee break, to see what's happening, scoop out some algae, or just see what plants or insects are visible or active. At this stage, the pond does look far more natural. Flowers and rushes that are planted in the pond itself have settled in, and the bedding plants around the margins have spread out a bit. As winter approaches, there's still actually a few flowers in bloom around the margins of the pond. My garden is quite sheltered, and November has been unusually mild, so the growing season hasn't quite finished yet. There's still plenty of pond skaters on the surface of the pond, but otherwise, life in and around the pond has become a lot quieter. There's still a number of lilies uh, visible on the pond surface and also below the water. Uh, I've put some barley straw in the water, uh, which is supposed to reduce algae buildup, so hopefully I'll have a better crop of lilies next year. So as Christmas approaches, the pond is almost a year old, um, and I can't wait for the spring for the cycle of growth to begin again. If you do have a back garden, I definitely recommend adding a pond of some sort. As I mentioned before, I, I watched a lot of Joel Ashton's work on YouTube before I started, and that helped me avoid making a lot of major mistakes. So with Christmas coming, there's no excuse not to start digging. And if you're in the Galway area, uh, drop me a line and I can give you a tour of my pond. <laughs>